This is the Fantasy Football Unlimited Podcast with your host, Kevin Murray. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Unlimited Podcast. On this episode, we have the head of content at Fantasy Alarm. He's a writer for the NY Post and an FSGA and FSWA award-winning host for Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio and a co-host of the Cash It Podcast. It is Roto Buzz Guy himself, Howard Bender. Welcome in, my friend. Dr. Kevin Murray. It's so great to be here, man. Usually we just we, we hang out at... Uh, at the Fantasy Football Expo, or it's an FSGA conference, so it's good to get to sit down and chat with you here. Absolutely, yeah. We're on the fifty yard line at the the Raiders Stadium, right? <laughs> yeah. Man, that tore through Allegiant Stadium. Shout out to Bob Lung for gra- grabbing us uh, uh, along with Scott Fish and Adam Ronas for that tour. That was amazing. Yeah, we had a we had a good time. We've definitely spent some good times together in in recent years, and it's always a pleasure to to spend some time with you. And so it's it's an honor to have you here today. You've uh, you've obviously made a name for yourself within the sport fantasy sports industry over the years. So let's take a few minutes to turn back to the clock to when you were growing up in in New York. Were you a huge football or a huge sports fan as a kid? Um, I was always a huge sports fan. It was kind of funny. My uh, my first love was baseball. Um, you know, I grew up uh, you know a couple of subway stops away from Yankee Stadium. Used to go as you know as as often as I could when I was a kid. Uh, you know, scraping together money to just sit out in the bleachers and uh, and and do that. Um, and I was also I was a diehard hockey fan too. Believe it or not, I was uh, I was gung ho about the New York Rangers. Um, even had a, a share of a season ticket package for a little while. But uh, you know, listen when you when you're in the fantasy sports world, and listen, I've always loved football. You always have to temper it being a Jets fan because then it's you know, I mean, it's it's just nothing but pain and suffering. But <laughs> You know, obviously, you know, football drives the uh, drives the bus in uh, in our industry and in the sports industry uh, in general. So there is definitely a love there. But the first love uh, definitely slides into baseball. That's interesting. Yeah, my first uh, my first favorite baseball player when I first started collecting cards as a kid was Don Mattingly. Uh, and that that uh, and then the 86 Mets happened. I love Doc Gooden and I, I loved uh, I love Greg Jeffries, you know, what what could what could have been. Right. And then <laughs> and then, you know, coming from Seattle, I, you know, I had Will Clark as a favorite player for a couple of years and then Griffey arrived. And so that's you know, that's that's my history with baseball. I love grew up, grew up loving baseball, every 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 ounce of it. And Griffey, uh, he saved the day in Seattle because it was not uh, not a good scene uh, in the early early years in the in Seattle Mariners baseball. You might so be a little young for it, but but the worst trade that one of the worst trades that the Yankees ever made, we sent uh, Jay Buhner to the Seattle yeah. Mariners for Ken Phelps. Yeah, not not too young for that. Jay <laughs> Jay Buhner was uh, was the man. He was a huge part of that of that uh, offensive lineup for sure. So growing up in New York, like how does that work? Is it is it just basically like it's passed down from family? Is it geography? How do you choose a team? Um, you know, the Yankee fandom that was passed down, uh, from, from my dad, my dad was, uh, he grew up in, in Queens. He grew up in Forest Hills. Um, his dad was a, uh, was a diehard Brooklyn Dodgers fan. Uh, and so my dad went the opposite way of his father, because I guess, you know, that's just kind of the, uh, the, it was the thing to do. And so he became a diehard Yankees fans, but because he was out there in Queens at the time that, you know, the Jets were the Titans and then the Jets, you know, joined the, uh, you know, the NFL. So because they played right near him, he became a, he became a Jets fan as opposed to a Giants fan. Usually the fandom is, is uh, Mets, Jets and Yankees, Giants. So uh, we split the difference. I get my, okay. uh, my, my love of championships from being a Yankees fan, but, you know, I always have to temper that enthusiasm by being a Jets fan, knowing that we're never going to win a Super Bowl. So is it more common to to hate the other the other side or or just kind of let them be? For football, I just let it be. It doesn't matter to me. I mean, the Giants have you know put together a, a phenomenal team over the years, and it's been a lot of fun to watch. Uh, you know, the Giants in the '80s were were unreal. You know, LT and Carl Banks and Pepper Johnson and those guys. Joe um, Morris, <laughs> Joe Morris, Mark Bavaro, and Bavaro. Uh, and Phil McConkie. I used to attend bar in New York City. And uh, and McConkey and Bovaro are actually regulars of mine, so would like sit there and talk to them, uh, you know, football all the time, and uh, and so there's no animosity at all against the uh, against the New York Giants. Now the Mets, on the other hand, that's a different story. I don't mind the team itself, 
It's the fan base that I can't stand. Mm. They just, you know, any, you know, it, 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 it's an inferiority complex. And you see this all the time. And you being a West Coast guy, you've seen it with like the Giants and the Dodgers is the Giants, you know, even though they won the World Series three times, uh, you know, since 2010, they still always feel inferior to the Los Angeles Dodgers. They always feel the need to kind of stick it to, to Dodger fans whenever they can. And Met fans are like that in New York. They have a massive inferiority complex and rightfully so. I mean, it's a, it's, you know, the organization has not been as storied as uh, the New York Yankees. I believe it was uh, Corey Parson who said uh, on a better morning show that I did with him, he said, you know, think about this Mets organization and really like what they're all about. The two times that they've won the world series, uh, one, they were the miracle Mets and the other one, they were the amazing Mets. So, you know, you, you look at that and say, well, the uh, the sun shines on a dog's ass, well, twice here, I guess. And uh, yeah. and that would be it. So Met fans, I just, I can't stand the their, their constant need to try and stick it to Yankees fans. You know, it's like, keep your, keep your attention on your own team. Don't worry about what we're doing. I love it. I love it. So when did you first discover fantasy sports? Ooh, I would say, you know, when, when I was growing up, I had a, uh, you know, obviously I had a, a, a friends whose dad played stratomatic uh for baseball and so you know i kind of got that that feel and that vibe for that um i did a fantasy baseball league when i was in high school um did a fantasy football league by hand in uh in college but uh obviously the when the when the boom really happened was in the late 90s and that's when the internet obviously blew up fantasy sports uh and that's when i like jumped neck deep into it and all of a sudden it was like you know, 1998, and I had five fantasy baseball teams, and I had a dozen fantasy football teams. So that's kind of where it all, uh, where it all kind of boosted. When did you start creating content? When did I start? Why? Well, you know what? I would say it's probably uh, right around the turn of the century here, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I love being able to say that. Yeah, I guess yeah, it was yeah. it was like 99, 2000. I had won some championships in fantasy baseball and won some championships in fantasy football. Um, I was a, uh, I was an, an actor slash bartender in New York city. I was doing some stand up comedy over there. Um, and I just, you know, I kind of got caught up more in the nightlife of New York as opposed to, you know, when you're in your early twenties and you're an idiot, uh, as opposed to, you know, paying more attention to, you know, grinding and going to auditions and things like that. And so, you know, when I was standing behind the bar, I was always kind of just doing my stand up set anyway. And so when I started doing that and started playing more fantasy sports and started reading, you know, guys like Dave Ganos and uh, and Dave Richard, you know, the, the the old CBS sports line crew, you know, I was reading through their stuff and I was like, you know, I could do this. I'm an educated man. I, you know, this, this is what, what's fun to me. I'd love sitting there. I, I love writing. I was always, you know, big on creative writing when I was growing up and, you know, I had no problem researching numbers and data for baseball. So, you know, it was like right around there. It was probably like 2000, 99 or 2000, where I started uh, just blogging. Um, Blogspot was the, uh, the the place of choice for a lot of people back then. I started up my own little blog spot thing called Roto Buzz uh, and just started writing every single day. And then, you know, just eventually there after a little while of, you know, treating it more as like a hobby. I tried to push it more in towards a, a career. And that's when I started sending all of my links and all of my content to any, any managing editor from any magazine I could find and uh, eventually got picked up. Nice. So, so did it take you a while to get, to get connected with people or was it pretty quick once you started really diving deep in that? Um, I would say it was, it was relatively quick. I mean, obviously it's it's not even it was not even remotely as super saturated a market as it is right now. Nowadays, I mean, a billion sites and a billion blogs and a billion podcasts out there. So it was it was hard, it was easier for me to to pick up with different sites because I promised them fresh content. Uh, I promised them daily content. I said I will do whatever it is that you need me to do to get on this site. And you know, I started writing for free. Uh, and and kind of just churning some stuff out, and then I started sending some stuff out. Uh, I think first paid gig wasn't even really a paid gig; it was like a on consignment sort of a thing, where it was like you know paid per how much traffic you get, how many clicks they get on the site. 
the original fan ball, Ray Flowers actually was the managing editor uh, for the original fan ball. And he picked me up as a, uh, as a beat writer to cover uh, the Chicago White Sox for them. So I was covering for them. Uh, and then from there, it just kind of, you know, spilled out where, you know, I kept asking Ray for, you know, more, more work to do. Uh, and so he put me in touch with Eno Saris over at Fangraphs. Uh, he put me in touch with, uh, with, with Jeff Erickson and Peter Schenke over at Rotowire. Uh, and from there I was, uh, I was freelancing for about, you know, three or four sites at that point, plus doing my own thing. And then it was basically, it was 2000, I guess it was 2010, 2011, really, where it all started to, to really blow up. And I, I was at a, uh, an FSGA event working it, by the way, as a, as a bartender, yeah. which was kind <laughs> of funny. And, you know, and, and all of a sudden, like I started meeting all of these people and, you know, the woman who was organizing it, shout out to Megan Van Patten. Uh, she started bringing everybody over to meet me. You know, she was like, she brought Peter Schenke uh, and Jeff Erickson over to the bar. And they were like, and she was like, yo, he writes for you guys. He's covering the Royals. And so, you know, kind of building that friendship and, and that relationship with everybody. And I walked out of there with like a stack of business cards, like that thick. I immediately, you know, like I got home, I wrote to everybody, emailed them all and said, you know, great to meet you. Thanks so much. Love to do some work for you. Here's links to all my stuff. And the next thing I know, I had, you know, like eight, nine freelance gigs going all at the same time. What a small world. That's such a cool story. The way that it all just kind of came together like that working, you know, in the, in the industry, but then being at an event behind the bar and I love it. That's so cool. So that was in that, that where was that in San Francisco? That was, yeah, that was here in San Francisco. It was Ted okay. and bar at a place near, you know, near the ballpark called Gordon Biersch. And, uh, and, th and that was it. Like the FSGA had their after party right there. And the woman who was working it, she knew that I had an interest in this. So she came to me and she was like, so do you want to work this party? Do you just want to hang out? I was like, Oh, let me work it. Cause when I'm standing behind the bar and I'm kind of doing my thing and it, you know, it shows me in a better light than me just having to like go around and try and meet people and interject myself into conversations. You come to me for a drink, little little friendly banter. And the next thing you know, I've got a business card in my hand. So <laughs> well played. I love it. I love it. So what <laughs> what what brought you out to San Francisco in, in California? Oh, well, you know what? I mean, my wife and I, we just got tired of the grind in New York, you know, finding different places to live, moving every like, uh, you know, every other year, stuff like that. Rents were getting uh, out of control. And my wife and I were, were a couple of deadheads. We're a bunch of dirty hippies who just kind of got that call to, by the mothership to San Francisco. My wife was in, uh, you know, she was managing live music venues in New York. And that was what she wanted to do. She wanted to be a part of that music scene in San Francisco. We're both big, big music people. So, you know, we went out there. I said, I can write from wherever I'm at. If I need to pick up a bar job, I could certainly pick up a bar job uh, and do it that way. So we just, we rolled up the stakes and, uh, and, and the tents and just moved right out to San Francisco. We didn't have any jobs. We didn't have a place to live. We just kind of set up shop there, talked our way into a, uh, into a, a lease on a, on a house over by ocean beach and the rest is history. That was 2007 is when that wow. was. Wow. Wow. Time flies. Time flies. Uh, now I, I love, I love sharing fantasy football resources and obviously your head of content at fantasy alarm. Uh, what's uh, let's talk about, let's talk about fantasy alarm, everything you got going on over there. What makes that content unique at fantasy alarm? Tell me about some of the talent over there. Where to begin? Oh, man. Um, all right. So we've got a lot of stuff actually going on with Fantasy Alarm because right now uh, we are also we are working uh, in, in the same organization under the same umbrella as the Better Sports Network. So with the Better Sports Network handling a lot of our audio and our video content, we're doing a lot more live streams over there, a lot of broadcasts, uh, you know, organizing different shows. Uh, so, I mean, that's fantastic. What I love about fantasy alarm. I mean, there's, there's like a million different things. First of all, the team that that's been assembled over at fantasy alarm is easily the hardest working and one of the best groups of, of people that I've ever, uh, I've ever met. We've seen, you know, I mean, listen, I think it's very telling that, you know, guys like John and Pemba, James Grande, um, you know, Justin Vreeland, uh, Dan Mayo, these guys have been with me for, you know, pretty much like a decade now. And you don't really see that very often 
in the industry, you see a lot of people just freelancing. You see a lot of people, you know, finding one spot and the next thing you know, they're leaving in a, in a year or two. Um, I think we've all just kind of, you know, we've, we've built this up to a point now where, you know, our following in our discord and, and, you know, well, where we where we attract uh, most of our followers on social media, it's really become a family. I mean, it's definitely I've I've coined the phrase you can't spell family without F A, <laughs> and uh, you know, and and it's you know because we don't we don't treat the you know people like subscribers, we treat them as friends and we treat them as family, and that's really what it comes down to. We might you know we try to get to every single question that everybody has, and and it's just it's such a great group. And, uh, you know, and, and the content is all first rate. I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever read Andrew Cooper's stuff on fantasy football or Britt Flynn's stuff on fantasy football. Uh, it's just, it's absolutely amazing. Colby Conway dominating in, uh, in fantasy baseball uh, as well. So to me, there's, there's, there's no better place than, than fantasy alarm, just because again, it's, it's family oriented. We're here to help everybody. We're here to teach. It's not just about, you know, here are the plays that you want to do. It's helping people be better DFS players, helping people be better drafters in, in redraft fantasy, better dynasty players, uh, things like that. So that's really, that's what we got over there at Fantasy Alarm. I love it. I love it. Uh, what's your experience been like working with Sirius Sports, uh, Sirius XM uh, Fantasy Sports Radio? Oh, it's been a ton of fun. I mean... <laughs> isn't that the goal right isn't that a goal for so many different people when you sit there and you you know you want your own show you know you you, you talk to people when i first started at sirius xm um i was just i was a guest for the rotowire show Derek van riper uh used to hit me up weekly every wednesday i would do a hit on sirius xm uh, and we talk royals baseball and then, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden when it started switching to football, I was also covering the, uh, the 49ers, uh, for Rotowire as well. So, you know, I would do these regular hits, uh, and then every so often, then I would get like a guest spot on a couple of other shows. And I started to become a little bit more of a, a guest in the regular rotation. Everybody knew that I would just, I wouldn't say no, you know, it was mm -hmm. like, can you do this bit? Yes, absolutely. Can you do this? Yes, I can. Didn't matter what time of day it was, especially being out here on the West coast. I mean, you know, I'll get up four or five o'clock in the morning. I don't really care if it means getting a, you know, kind of getting on a show and, and building myself up. So I was doing that for probably about, I'd say like two years or so. And then I finally just started pestering uh, Matt Deutsch, who was the program director at that point. And I said, you know, dude, I give me a show. I need a show. I need a show. I can do this. You've heard me as a guest. You know what I'm all about. Here's written content that I've done. Here's audio content from me. I said, so, you know, make it happen. And eventually I, I wore him down. Tenacity <laughs> does that. I broke down that wall and uh, I ended up on the, uh, doing the Sunday night show. It's not a great, you know, time slot, but the absolute perfect place to, to kind of cut your teeth, uh, learn how to host, uh, you know, how to be a good radio host. You're working with uh, some outstanding people. And, uh, and that's where I was. And then this was 2017. Yeah, I think it was 2017 or 2018, right before the baseball season started. And I took over the fantasy alarm show, uh, which was drive time Monday through Friday. And it's been a, a, a phenomenal ride ever since. That's awesome. That's cool. How about uh, working with Adam Ronas on the Cash It podcast? podcast? Oh, he's the worst, dude. Yeah, you know, Ronas <laughs> is just terrible. He's a terrible person. I mean, think about this. Think about you. You take me and Ronas. We are two crotchety old men. We are like we are. You know, if you, if you want to compare it, we are Waldorf and Statler, the two old guys from the Muppet Show, <laughs> right? Just sitting in the balcony, just doing that. But like, well, when we do the Cash It podcast, the whole basis of that is not just about, it's not just feeding you plays and stuff like that. It's what would it sound like if you were eavesdropping in on a, on a conversation between Howard and Adam? You know, we, we just, we talk all sports, we talk betting, we talk DFS, we talk fantasy, uh, you know? So I think that, you know, it, it gives you a different kind of perspective. And then he and I are both so used to being family friendly uh, on Sirius XM that when we two of us are doing the podcast, well, you know, then all of a sudden the New York comes out a little bit more. It's <laughs> F this, F that, and, you know, so 
Um, it's, it's a blast. I love working with Adam. He was one of those guys who I had never worked with for a really long time throughout the industry. Um, and then I would say, yeah. in like the last four or five years since he, uh, I, I brought him over to fantasy alarm. As soon as I found out he was a free agent, I immediately brought him over to fantasy alarm. I was like, I've wanted to work with this guy for so long that here we go. We, we have the moment here and it's been fantastic since. That's great. That's great. All right, uh, let's dive into some rapid fire questions. I'll just rip off a question. Just give me first things that come to mind. Okay. Here we go. Uh, what do you love most about fantasy sports? Uh, the smack talk. Yeah, so that's definitely a, definitely a fun aspect of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, whose who's content did you consume most when you were rising up in the industry? Um, the most I, I, you know, it was the guys from fan graphs for baseball. And then, uh, and then the guys from Rotowire, Jeff Erickson, Chris Liss, uh, Jason Thornberry. Those were the guys who, uh, I spent the majority of my time reading as I was coming up through the ranks. All right. Uh, share some of your thoughts on the Scott fish bowl. Oh, I love the Scott fish bowl. I love it. I love Scott fish. What he does is phenomenal. I love the charity aspect of it. Uh, you know, having this community, like really give back. Um, I might not participate in all of these uh, chat rooms and DMs that, that we have on Twitter because they are a lot and it is excessive. But <laughs> I, I mean, I just I love the community for it. I mean, I don't I don't do well scoring wise. It's really kind of funny. But I mean, I have a blast doing it. And again, it's, you know, uh, it's it's just it's it's being able to like, you know, talk crap to a bunch of people. Uh, who you don't know. And like, all of a sudden they're like, you know, they realize that you're just a normal dude. Like, that's the thing. Like, I mean, I've had people have been like, wow, you know, it's, I was really nervous about coming up and talking to you at the, at the fantasy football expo. I'm like, I, I kind of feel like I'm one of the more approachable people out there. I'm pretty down to earth. So, you know, so to be able to have that connection with a bunch of people, industry people and fans in the, uh, in the Scott fishbowl, it's, it's phenomenal. How about the live SFB experience? Ooh, it's a little tougher. It's it's tough to to draft your own team and to and to host and make sure that everybody's having a great time. When's the food getting here? Uh, you know, are people tipping the bartender or not? And you know, kind of making sure that you know everybody stays on pace and 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 we go through it all. Um, it's a ton of fun. I mean, listen, there's nothing better than a live draft. We we've just been so inundated with online drafts that I think a lot of people forget about just how amazing that in draft experience uh, can be. I mean, I saw your, your video of the one that you did in Seattle last year, which like completely blew the San Francisco one out of the water. Um, <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, right. I mean, it's, it's so much fun being in a live draft. There's just a different energy around the people. Yeah, that's right. Now you and you hosted SFB last year, and you're doing it again, right? Is that right? Yes, in San Francisco, July eighth in San Francisco at Public Works. Limited availability. You have to email me at uh, rotobuzzguy at gmail dot com if you uh, if you if you wanted to attend. I love it. I'm actually going down to um, to LA, so I'm going to do that one this year. So nice. I'm really excited. Trophy, Trophy Smack knows how to how to put things together as they well. Really so. do, don't they? I love those guys. <laughs> But speaking of live drafts, what makes a great live draft for a fantasy league? What makes a great live draft? I, I mean, again, it's 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 the people. Like you can have bells and whistles and do all sorts of fun things, like you know, choosing the draft order in some sort of a way or anything like that. But to me, it's like it's it's when the when when the person gets up to put that sticker on the board. Right. And then everybody's either trashing them or they're like, oh, you like, like that's <laughs> it's like that energy that you get from the entire room. And it's funny with SFB, um, we have two drafts going on simultaneously. So like immediately you'll hear like an uproar from one side of the room and everybody's like, oh, wait, let me go see what's going on there. Uh, and, and they kind of do it that way. So it's it's always about the people and, and the interaction. That's great. That's great. I can see how it'd be a lot of fun. You get the the noise coming from both sides. I love it. Uh, what what uh, what's your most memorable home fantasy league experience? My most memorable. Uh, so I so I used my my old home league in in baseball. We would sit there. We would get together. It was a uh, it was a blind bidding process. So what you would do is you would submit your bid sheet of your players. You needed two at every position. With uh, with six outfielders and nine pitchers, 
And then you just had to kind of guesstimate. You put your bid amount there. You put a letter as a tiebreaker uh, in case, you know, in case that was needed. And then you submit your sheet. And then you've got like a couple of guys who are sitting around the table, like three or four who have the sheets in front of them. And we start calling off players and, you know, and like, ah, it was just, it was so, there was so much anxiety. If you weren't at that table, like looking at the bid sheets, your anxiety level was just freaking out, wondering if you were going to get undercut or anything like that. Um, And we used to do that, you know, I mean, until we ended up, you know, guys moved, all over the country. And, and so it was always tough to kind of get that live draft experience again, but man, if you've never done a blind bid, you know, if you do fab bidding, you know, you understand the concept of the blind bid, but man, when you're setting up that draft sheet for the first time, it is just. I love it. I love it. Oh, uh, what's your favorite last place punishment idea? Like just craziest one you can think of out there that, that just blows your mind. Um, I mean, I'm I'm always about uh you know the last place person paying for the the first place person's entrance fee the following year. I don't believe in I don't believe in tattoo punishments. I think that's yeah. just the worst thing you can possibly do. Uh-huh. As, as 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 somebody who has tattoos, right? I mean, yeah, I've got tattoos all mm-hmm. over, but I, you know, to to do that, I think is just that that's no good. Um, I don't mind that you know that that side of the road. Kind of thing. I think the best one that I heard, you know what? Here you go. The best one that I heard was that the loser of the league had to go to a dog park and cover his body in peanut butter, you know, fully clothed, <laughs> but cover your body in peanut butter and then stand in the middle of the dog park. And all the dogs just, just <laughs> boom, just jump on top of you. Everybody's licking, everybody's going nuts. And it's, uh, yeah, that was that was probably the funniest that I heard. We, we'll probably implement that one uh, yeah. in a local league here in San Francisco. Oh my gosh, that would be that would be a sight to see for sure. Uh, my okay, wife, so- my wife would be like, you know what? I'll finish last every year. Go ahead, do it to me. <laughs> you love dogs, right? Absolutely. Uh, uh, t- tell me about your dogs. You have some cool dogs. Um, my wife and I were all about the rescue. We love, you know, huskies are, are our favorite breed. Very difficult, obstinate dogs, but you train them right and you give them the the amount of love and the loyalty is just mind blowing. But we've got um, we've got an Alaskan Husky right now. We've got a Husky uh, Shepherd mix, and then we've got a a Husky Gray Wolf, uh, and she is just she is absolutely gorgeous. But you know you've got I mean she's probably like twenty five to thirty percent Gray Wolf, so wow. she's got a couple of a uh, couple of you know personality characteristics she doesn't trust people at all loves all dogs loves you know our other dogs and you know like immediately is just bonkers playing with them uh but she just doesn't trust people so you know a little bit you know at times she's a little bit of a special needs dog but listen i i i wouldn't trade it for the world no human children here i got three dogs three cats and uh you know what if i had my way i'd probably have 10 more of each i love it i love it Okay, what are your thoughts on the Fantasy Football Expo? Wow, such a great event, right? Bob Lung really does that right in Canton. And it's I've watched it grow and grow and grow each year. And uh, last year was actually the first time I, I got to attend it, you know? So that was probably one of the most exciting experiences. And again, it's why I try to be as approachable as possible because, yeah, I mean, listen, I talk to the industry folks all the time and, it's great to interact and to have some fun, uh, you know, with uh, other writers and other, you know, content creators. But when you get a chance to like really hang out with, with fans and people who listen to you on the radio, subscribe to your website, uh, you know, all of that stuff to me, that's, I uh, dude, I love it. And there's, there's really, there's nothing better. Like when I was at the expo, I mean, it was, it was just unbelievable. I was like trying to just meet as many new people as I possibly could. And it wasn't even just, you know, industry people. It was great to meet industry people face to face, but you know, I, my focus was definitely on, uh, you know, fans of fantasy sports. That's great. Yeah. It's a, it's such a cool event. Bob does such a good time. Can't wait for uh, this August. Uh, how, how many fish concerts have you attended? <laughs> I stopped counting after, a, after a while ago. I mean, it's, it's over 300. Um, 
I mean, you know, we, I, I started listening to, to, you know, Fish. I saw them for the first time in college, and that was my freshman year in 1989. Um, so, you know, you, you kind of you, you do that that college circuit when you're a college student and you hit those, you know, in upstate New York, you catch all of those. But, you know, moving back into New York City right out of college, being right there, it was like you had Madison Square Garden, Nassau Coliseum on Long Island. You're in driving distance to the Spectrum in Philly, to the Boston Garden. Um, I mean, you could just you could travel down to D.C. It's super easy to, to do that. So, you know, doing the whole eastern seaboard for years and years and then, you know, gradually moving west all the time. Yeah, the 90s were an amazing time, the mid to late 90s for uh, for just doing fish tours. And, uh, and that's kind of where I uh, where I settled out. So, yeah, I stopped counting after a, a while. I wasn't one of those, you know, fish guys who, you know, keep stats of, of all the shows that they've been to. I just know that I've been to a ton. Nice. Nice. Now, would you rather go see fish again or go attend Taylor Swift's era tour concert? Well, I'll always take uh, I'll always take a fish show. <laughs> I'll always take a fish show, but I gotta be honest with you, man. I because I'm such a I'm I'm such a huge music guy, and I've said this over and over again. If you have the opportunity to see an icon, then you take that opportunity. And it doesn't it doesn't have to be a, of, of the Taylor Swift, you know, Prince, uh, you know, explosion of just how big they are. I mean, there are others. Um, when I got married, and my wife and I got married in Vegas. We ran off to Las Vegas. Her idea, which super special there but when i saw that tom jones was playing uh the 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 mgm and wayne newton was playing the stardust i was like well we gotta do that like i'm not gonna get married in las vegas and have the opportunity to see wayne newton and tom jones and not take that opportunity i've seen neil diamond at madison square garden um i mean you know you you name it i've i've gone to see so many shows just to see how you know icons uh as they uh, as they go through that's cool now that we're actually going to to swift uh in like three weeks in seattle so uh my wife and daughter so it's gonna be a lot of fun we're excited do you have your friendship friendship bracelets all we made haven't, we have not, not yet not yet daughter's outfit picked out we are in the planning stages right now all right good 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 <laughs> if you need any tips you can hit me up on sirius xm fast sports radio our producer Shannon Blunt, she was just at the Pittsburgh show, and so she's got every all the tips and tricks that you need. Okay, sounds good. I'll hit you up for sure. <laughs> all right, uh, next, uh, predict the 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 year that the New York Jets will win their next Super Bowl. Ooh, uh, it'd be the year after I die. Now <laughs> I'm overweight. I'm not healthy. Death probably coming sooner than it is later for me. So maybe that does give the Jets a, a little bit of hope. But they won the Super Bowl the year before I was born. And they'll probably win it next the year after I die. That's probably uh, what it is. Unreal. Uh, yeah. What, what have been some of your biggest challenges that you faced in your journey within the fantasy sports industry? Ooh. Well, for starters, moving out west and having to be on East Coast time. That was that's that was something I, I had to, you know, I really had to deal with, especially when you're like you're tending bar at night to make ends meet. Uh, and you know that you've got to be up at five o'clock in the morning to take the news the uh, the rest of the way. Um, I guess that would probably be the biggest challenge because, you know, I mean, it, it sounds trite and cliche. They say if you uh, love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. And I'll be honest with you, the fact that I'm writing articles about baseball and football. I'm talking about it on, on the air uh, constantly. I'm, I'm co-hosting a, a show with, with a former general manager of baseball, right? Jim Bowden, Matt, you know, he was the GM of the Reds. He was the GM of the Nationals. He, he won World Series with, with, with both organizations. Like to know that that's my co-host, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely, it's, it's still very surreal. I've been in this business now. Uh, for over 20 years, and it still blows my mind uh, each and every time. So challenges, nothing really, man. I uh, I get up every day ready to work. I love it. That's great. Uh, so as you look back on your career, what are some of your favorite memories? Ooh, fav all right. Well, so the FSGA in in 2010, without a doubt, was just. I mean, that was a groundbreaking moment for for me, just in this industry. 
Um, the all-star break, I think it was 2011 or 2012, the MLB all-star break. I went to, uh, I went to Vegas with the Rotowire team and got to hang out with all those guys we had a poker tournament. Uh, I mean, that was just, that was a, a, a fantastic time. Uh, 2011, actually the FSGA, they came back to San Francisco uh, and I was freelancing at RT Sports, Fantasy Alarm, Rotowire, uh, Fangraph. Still, I was all over the the, the place. And uh, and at the FSGA conference, my wife was running a a live music venue in San Francisco, uh, and it was Lil Kim's first show <laughs> since she got out of jail at the club. So I, I invited everybody that I knew at FSGA. I said, "Come with me." And we walked in and we were like, I mean, we, st you know, we stood out like, like a turd in a punch bowl at that <laughs> show. But like we walk up and there's like a huge line around the block. We walk up to the front, the, the, everybody who there, you know, knows who I am. They know we're, we're coming. They immediately bracelet us all. They walk us in, they bring us up to, uh, to our bottle service table which was like the premier table to have in the club. They drop a bunch of bottles in front of us. And we just, we, we partied all night long uh, as VIPs. That was uh, that was a phenomenal, phenomenal time there as well. And then, um, you know what? And I got to throw down the, uh, the, the spring training in Arizona trip that I took with the Fangraphs team. That was probably right around there also, 2012, 2013. Um, yeah, that was just... You know, Eno Saris just throwing micro brews at us, and and it was just, it was, it was so good. It was my first That's trip awesome. to uh, to Arizona for spring training. So That's cool. That's some good good memories. Wow. Uh, what uh, name name three people, or you know, name a couple people that have had just a massive impact on you during your your journey in the in the industry. All right. Well, man, I mean. <laughs> There's a really long list here. <laughs> you only want me to limit it to three? I can't limit it to three. <laughs> okay. Ray Flowers gave me my first paying job in the industry. Uh, Jeff Erickson, Chris List, Peter Schenke, the Rotowire team. I love them to death. Um, Jeff Manns, uh, one of the greatest football minds out there. He was with Fantasy Alarm. He hired me at Fantasy Alarm uh, and really taught me how to analyze football in a, in a much better sense. Um, so yeah, I, I, there you go. I'll, I'll just, I'll limit it to those three right now, but you know, there's like a list of 20 names I could give you here. Easy. Oh, I, I imagine. I, I, I believe it. Uh, what advice do you have for aspiring fantasy sports analysts that are looking to get more involved in the industry? Don't ever turn down a gig like that's, you know, I get it. You want to be paid for your, for your work, but you work in a very super saturated market. Everybody wants to work in sports. Everybody wants to do their own podcast. Everybody wants to do their own show. We've seen it a million times. You need to figure out the best way to stand out. And to be perfectly honest, and you might hate hearing me say this, but it's the people who don't ask about what they're being compensated when they're first in the industry. Like you, you give me two guys who come to me and, you know, and, and say, I want to work for you. And I'm interviewing the both of them. Uh, and I can only choose one, right? If if one of them turns around to me and is like, all right, so what am I getting paid? And the other one's just like, yes, I would love this job and I want to do it. You know, it's not that I'm trying to be cheap. It's that I want dedication. I want love of sport. I want passion. I don't want somebody who's just in it for the paycheck and, and you know, to be able to say that they work in sports. I want dedicated hardworking people. I want people who are willing to make sacrifices in their lives to be able to do this. I mean, I've been, you know, 20 years in the fantasy industry and I'm still working weekends at times. I don't want to, but that's what you have to do. Sports is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I don't, you know, I take vacations very limited. Um, but it, to me, it's all about, it's, it's what you put in there. And so if you're trying to break in and you want to separate yourself. Sure. If you've got a gimmick and you've got like a little niche that, that, that you want to like slide into and think that you can dominate that. Sure. That's great. But it's the people who show that, that they just, they want to work in this. They've got a passion for it. And, and that's, what's most important. The work is what's most important for them. 
uh, and you know, and the experience of of their subscribers and readers and and users. So that's what I think. Because I mean, guys like me are doing the hiring, and if you start telling me that you don't want to work weekends, uh, the pay is not enough. Well, okay, move on. You go find somebody else who's you know willing to pay you for such a lack of dedication. Go ahead. That's great. Great advice, Howard. Great advice. Uh, well, obviously, you know, we've covered a lot of information. Is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to share before we close things out here? Mm. Mm. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I feel like I've, uh, I've, I've, I've kind of given you a, a whole lot of me in here. I don't know. Is there anything that you want to ask me, Kevin, that you, you haven't asked me yet? Well, let's, let's go over a couple, a couple actually fantasy football related questions. Uh, we got a lot of drafts ahead of us coming up in the next few months. Is there uh, tell me one quarterback that you're going to leave most drafts with one quarterback. I'm going to leave most drafts with, um, I'll go with Daniel Jones. Solid. How about, uh, how about two running backs, two running backs? Um, well, I mean, if I get that first round pick and I can grab me some Bijan Robinson, I mean, I, I love that, but, um, you know what? Everybody keeps letting Nick Chubb slide. You keep letting Nick Chubb slide. I will grab him every time. Sounds good. Is there another one? Oh, you already named you already named Bijan, you B- right? Oh, I gave you Nick Chubb. You want me to? Yeah. Do you want me to go yeah. deeper? I can go yeah, I don't know. That's good. Oh yeah, let's give me a deep, deep, uh, a deep flyer running back. Roshan Johnson from the Chicago Bears. That's you know, I'm using a late round pick on him. Sounds good. How about uh, two wide receivers? Two wide receivers who I absolutely love. For rookies this year, I love me some Jordan Addison. I'm in on that. If I have the first pick in, in a draft, number one, the 1-1, one, one, for me it's Jamar Chase over Justin Jefferson. So I'll, I'll do that. And then, uh, you know, if I'm just going to, like, splash in a guy who, uh, who I think everybody's kind of sleeping on right now, Cortland Sutton. He's the ex-receiver. In a uh, in now a Joe Lombardi offense, and we all know what Joe Lombardi does to the ex receivers, he force feeds them targets over and over again. So, I'll take a little Cortland Sutton, too. What do you think Russ's season is gonna be like this year? Oh, uh, I don't know, man. I don't know. We're, we're, we're gonna find out. I mean, I will, I'll take a chance on him late, absolutely. I think that you know, people are just kind of letting him, you know, fall to that 10th, 11th round, uh, and people are viewing him more as a QB, too. I'm perfectly fine, you know, waiting on, on Russ. I'll probably, if I, if I'm going to take Russell Wilson, it means I either have one of the elites who is just, you know, sitting up top and, and I waited a really long time for a second QB, or I waited on the position and I'm taking a guy like Daniel Jones, who I know is going to start for the, uh, and, and perform well for the giants, but then I'll take Russell Wilson in there and, uh, and see if maybe, you know, he can be one of those, you know, late round guys who actually pops. How about tight end? Are you going to take one of those top top tight ends early, or are you going to wait wait later on and and uh, take a bargain? Listen, it, it's Travis Kelsey or bust. If I don't get Travis Kelsey, then I am perfectly fine waiting for Chiga Conquo or Jawan Johnson. Those are my two dark horse tight ends at the bottom. Where are you taking Travis Kelsey? Is it first round? Top? Yeah, yeah. I'll take him in the first round. I I have no issues with that whatsoever. Love it, love it. All right, Howard. Thank you so much. I think we'll we'll close things out here. I appreciate you coming on. I cannot wait to see what you got in store for the 2023 football season. Dr. Kevin Murray, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to get to hang with you. Absolutely, my friend. Thank you for listening to the Fantasy Football Unlimited Podcast. Until next time. Be sure to follow and subscribe to all of FFU's social media accounts for daily content.